Welcome to a special episode of The Great Humbling. I'm Dougald Hine, co-founder of the Dark Mountain Project and a school called Home. Since the spring of 2020, I've been recording these conversations with my friend, the poet and recovering futurist Ed Gillespie. In February 2023, I took my book at Work in the Ruins on tour around the UK. As part of that, we recorded this special live episode of The Great Humbling with some very special guests, Charlotte Ducan and Rupert Reed. So this is a belatedly released recording of the conversation we had that night in February at Norwich Arts Centre. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming along. Uh, This is going to be our first ever uh, live recorded episode of The Great Humbling. So I just wanted to sort of set the scene a little uh, about the conversation that we'd like to have. Uh, We're going to be opening up for some questions and an interaction from the audience. We very much want to frame this as a participatory conversation. This is not an expert panel. This is not going to be too chummy and friendly up here. Uh, We intend to be quite challenging and provocative um, to one another as well in a warm-hearted and gentle fashion. Um, Dougald and I, for those of you who haven't listened to The Great Humbling... um, first spoke in February 2020, um, immediately before uh, the start of the pandemic. Um, After a decade or so of manoeuvring around each other, uh, we finally met in the flesh uh, last summer. Um, But the idea of the great humbling actually emerged from our very first Skype conversation, uh, where we both finished a call and went, we should probably have recorded that. Um, such was the kind of the interest and so we're three years and and four series in but what the podcast is really about is a shared sense of humility um, a genuine humbling about literally being brought back down to earth which I think is a thread which weaves um, seamlessly through Dougald's book so it's appropriate that we're doing the first live episode here um, in the kith of Norfolk um, hosted by Rupert Um, It's also where my roots are. It's the current home uh, of Dark Mountain. Well, that's Suffolk, actually, to be fair. Let's get the borders correct here before I get into trouble. You're not Um, in Suffolk anymore. (laughs) (laughs) It's getting Uh, feisty already. (laughs) Um, And we're framing this, obviously, as a climate conversation that goes where other conversations do not reach. Because, as Dougald asks in the book, climate change asks us questions that climate science cannot answer. Uh, And in the opening chapter... Uh, of at work in the ruins, Dougal finds himself wondering whether it's time to stop talking about climate change full stop, saying, are the ways we talk about the trouble the world is in at risk of making everything worse? Is it time to step away from the language of emergency, the mobilisation of fear and panic, and the calls to believe in science? Do we need to start from somewhere else if we are to avoid responses to the climate crisis that reproduce the patterns that brought about the crisis in the first place? It's what Bio Akomalafe has called a call to fugivity, uh, which is a great word if you haven't been called to fugivity before, and we're going to try and do that tonight. Um, and what Gail Bradbrook has prescribed as something, uh, as an appropriate response to our press on itis. Um, But without further ado, I would like to invite my fellow conversationalists um, to introduce one another. So, Charlotte, would you do us the honour of introducing Dougal? Absolutely. Thank you, Ed. Um, It's said that uh, the first 15 minutes uh, when you meet someone uh, creates the shape of your relationship to come. So I first met Dougal in 2011, and I had my notebook at hand because I was doing an article about the Uncivilization Festival and I wanted to speak to one of the the founders, the co-founders of the Dark Mountain Project about which I knew nothing. So we're sitting on a log, right? And I've just overheard somebody saying something because I was really embedded in the transition movement at that time, including in Transition Norwich. And climate change was all flip charts, you know, it was all like we've got to save the planet and it was like, are we counting the carbon? And I'd already turned my central heating off and done all the right things, right? So I'm sitting next to Dougald and I said, I've just heard somebody say, 
if transition is the village, dark mountain is the shaman. Oh, and I thought that was very sexy indeed. <laughs> oh, okay. So, why is dark mountain the shaman? He said, well, we go into conversation, very different kinds of conversation. Um, conversations that are deeper, that are more reflective, that really connect to our deep capacity for adaptation. And at that moment, we were in this huge wood and the world just kind of like opened because I am not a person who loves flip charts. And, but I love the earth and I love creativity and I love myth. And in that moment, it all came rushing into that space that Dougald had opened. So really, when I think of Dougald to introduce him, I'm not going to do the CV thing, although I can quickly say uh, he's done a lot of speaking, a lot of writing, a lot of introduction, but probably more than that, He's been this incredible network node, um, which might not sound very sexy, but if you think about the, the, the world and our communication system and how we confront all these different things, these different crises, really the mycelial nature of our connections is deeply, deeply key. And there, we need people like Dougald who can actually be that interchange, can be the kind of king's cross, if you like, of... Um, of, of all our uh, transport systems and our communication. Sorry, Dougal, I didn't really need to compare you to a rather grubby London station. But um, it's really the keys. And also the thing about holding that, those kinds of spaces, which he's been doing since he um, worked as, actually with, with, with a... Um, it's not a company, it was, a, it was an organisation called Space Makers, which was literally physically opening spaces for different conversations to happen. And then with the, when he started the Dark Mountain Project opening a space for writers and artists responding to crises in a very different way. This is a space where there's a lot of space in here and a lot of time. <laughs> um, Dougald, is that, is it, does that cover it? Thank you, Charlotte. I've always thought of myself as more of a St Pancras. Have you? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you, can choose, you can choose whichever station you like, Dougal. The bit, the, the bit that Charlotte hasn't mentioned is the, the, this space that opened for you, sort of sucked you into the point where you now carry the responsibility for running Dark Mountain. But Rupert will tell you more about, about Charlotte in a minute. It falls to me to introduce Ed Gillespie. Ed, how do I introduce you after four series together, for most of which we had never actually met in the flesh, so I had no idea how tall he was. Um, I mean, Ed is somebody who I've been aware of for a long time because he's been, again, you know, somebody who's connected so many people within the environmental movement in Britain and beyond, um, not least as the co-founder of Futera from right back in 2001. Futera, the environmental communications agency that was once memorably referred to by my Dark Mountain co-founder, Paul Kingsnorth, as the Ryanair of the environmental movement. <laughs> Ed is a man who has been on a journey, uh, more than one journey. He wrote, he wrote a book about travelling around the world without flying, um, but also a journey that took you to Martin Shaw's School of Myth, and a journey that took you to Ireland to study with Paul Kingsnorth and... Uh, after shooting cider out of water pistols at each other or something, you've made friends. Um, and that, I think it was kind of through those conversations and connections that you found your way finally into, in, in touch with me just before the pandemic. And I'm really grateful because when the pandemic came along, I was in the middle of writing a series of essays, which uh, um, some people in this room were quite closely connected to, called... Notes from Underground, which was an attempt to make sense of the sort of deep currents running below this extraordinary explosion of climate activism in 2018 and 2019, and to sort of ask some of the underlying questions that might be helpful to people who had had powerful experiences within those movements. And then the pandemic came along, and I, you know, it kind of all ground to a halt for me as a writer. I've never felt less inclined to tell stories than I did in those early weeks of the pandemic because it felt like everyone was rushing in trying to kind of wrap this strange experience of the pandemic in stories, mostly in the stories that they had already been telling two weeks earlier, rather than sit with the sense of being kind of slightly stripped naked by this collective encounter with mortality. And Ed, it was talking to you and then beginning to record the podcast together 
through which I found another voice in which to be speaking publicly in that moment. And we sort of found this way of puzzling through the stories that we were hearing together and trying to find a mode that was that didn't speak with the same kind of confidence and certainty that maybe I had been speaking with um, prior to that sudden kind of sense of the world sliding sideways so it's a strange thing to sort of become friends with someone through a screen with conversations that are being recorded and shared with lots of other people but I feel like that's what has happened over the last three years and it's really great to be uh, sitting on stage and getting to share the friendship and these friendships and the conversation with you all and hear from some of you this evening as well so um, Ed I'm going to hand over to you to introduce Rupert thank you and if anyone wants a cider-filled water pistol fight, I'll be in the bar afterwards. Um, uh, this is Professor Rupert Reed, uh, who many of you will be obviously be familiar with. Um, I've known Rupert a decade or more, I think now. More. Um, yeah, more. Um, we first came together through, uh, obviously, the environmental movement, but Rupert was doing a lot of work around green politics in the Greenhouse Think Tank. Um, we used to convene dinners together at my old office in London, um, trying to bring journalists uh, into our agenda, trying to get them to convince them to write interesting things. Um, what fascinates me about Rupert is bringing that sort of philosophical edge um, into things. We then really kind of stepped up our friendship, I guess, after... Uh, an event in the Lake District in 2018, the Poetics of Leadership event, um, uh, curated by Jem Bendel, um, who we'll be familiar with. Um, Rupert's been obviously one of the key spokespeople for XR um, in the last few years, um, written multiple books, as you can see from the groaning tables uh, in the reception out there. Um, we've had the odd pirate party together, um, but he's a philosopher that does stuff, um, and that's always got to be useful. So, Rupert, if you would like to complete the circle by introducing Charlotte. Well, absolutely. But what can I say? Charlotte has already effectively introduced herself with that incredible, vivacious, different introduction of, of Dugald. Uh, but she is a woman of very many uh, parts. Uh, I've encountered all sorts of them over the years uh, as part of the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not that part. <laughs> well, we have been... Uh, we have been swimming together in the sea. Uh, yeah, remember with, that? With costumes. Bloody cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I first met Charlotte um, in... Well, I didn't quite first meet Charlotte. I, I got to know Charlotte best first through our being columnists together on the Eastern Daily Press. Uh, not many people know that, which is why eventually the column <laughs> folded. Uh, no, we were, we were there for, in total for, for five years, actually. It was, it was a remarkable experiment in um, a big regional newspaper actually giving activists and greenies and so on a voice. And so it was splendid to get to know Charlotte properly in that way. But the thing I want to focus on, really, is the extraordinary role that Charlotte has played uh, in Dark Mountain after Dougald uh, sucked her into it in the, in the first place. And uh, there's m many magnificent Dark Mountain books outside, and I, I mean it, they are magnificent. They are all beautiful objects, and that's partly because of Charlotte's exquisite visual cur curation of them. She's also a really superb uh, editor of words, and I got to know this up close and, and personal. Uh, put that in deliberately to keep the sort of joke going. Uh, <laughs> When, uh, when I uh, submitted a piece to Dark Mountain and she really went at it with a very um, charming scalpel uh, and it emerged um, considerably superior to the form I'd submitted it in. And she got it illustrated by this incredible artist, Angela Cocaine, uh, whose incredible uh, images of whales now adorn the cover of my book, which you can find outside on one of those groaning Table. So I'm grateful to Charlotte for, for many things, and it's splendid to be on this platform with you here this evening. Thank you, Rupert. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I'm not going to take a sort of formal chairing role this evening. We're very much intending this to be a conversation, so um, I won't be kind of trying to interlocute between people, but I will <coughs> just try and set things up um, a little right at the beginning. Um, Dougald, this is your first book, even though you have been a very prolific writer. Um, you have also been on quite a tour, haven't you? Um, 
a, t- a transcontinental tour um, through Europe and around the UK. Um, tell us how that's been going before we actually dig into the book itself. What, is, what are your reflections and your feelings having been out there and discussing and sharing some of the ideas in the book with different audiences? Yeah. Well, I mean, coming back to the UK, I mean, you can probably tell by my voice that this is kind of where I come from originally. I've been living in Sweden now for 11 years. And uh, I was... There was a moment when I was talking with Chelsea Green, um, my very... Uh, supportive publisher about this big trip and all of the events and and I I said "Uh, shall we call it On Tour in the Ruins Um, and uh, then we decided that it sounded a little bit too close to the mark Um, you know not necessarily but yeah I mean wherever I've gone I've been very conscious of the toll that um you know, the past 13 years of austerity and whatever else you think of it, the impacts of the way that Brexit has been playing out and the impact of the pandemic and the response to it have taken on this society and on communities and how much of the kind of the conversation about... Because this is a book that's not just about climate change. It's about living through the end of the world as we have known it and how much of that feels like it's something that's already in the present tense rather than some kind of looming future threat, and actually how it becomes possible to have these conversations about what it means to be at work in the ruins, that there is work to be done among the failure of existing systems, among the playing out of consequences, that doesn't look like pretending this is a temporary deviation that can be fixed and everything will go back to some kind of... Hans Rosling or Stephen Pinker trajectory of human history, I, how far precisely because of the hard times that are playing out in a lot of places in this country, it becomes possible to have a different kind of conversation. I mean, in Sweden, where I live, there's a kind of half serious um, phrase, the world's most modern country that was the title of a TV series made by a guy who's kind of the Swedish equivalent of Stephen Fry. That's a concept to boggle your mind anyway. But um, (laughs) he he made this series about Sweden's self-image and the way that Sweden has been seen in the world, particularly during the 20th century. And what strikes me now is Sweden is kind of the world's last modern country. Because if you're the world's most modern country, but the tide of modernity is going out, then what that means is you're the one that's left furthest up the beach least able to grasp what's actually going on in the way that history is now unfolding. Um, So I've been kind of taking this book into conversation with all sorts of people up and down the country, and I think it's some of the conversations with the projects and places that I've visited that have really struck me. And I'm thinking now of a conversation I had with my aunt, who used to be a senior probation officer in County Durham and who's now retired, and she came down to a workshop that... Um, some friends organised in London that was bringing people together around the questions in the book. And she's involved these days in running food banks and warm spaces and lots of the kind of creating community infrastructure to catch people who are being dropped by the system and with her local church and community. And she said as she'd been reading the book she'd realised that she was carrying some, some anger, some justified anger, at experiences of seeing how the system is failing people, experiences of people who legally should be being supported by services, and those services are actually dropping them on the doorstep of the community organisation that she's involved with. And she said as she was reading, it hit her that, you know, things are never going back to the way they used to work when modernity worked and the only thing that's going to make a difference is the solidarity and the care for each other that we build at community level which has the capacity to embody meaning and embody care in ways that the systems of modernity at a systemic level anyway never really could because care when it is bureaucratized is a very different thing to what the word care has meant historically within human culture and so within the ruins within the mess 
you know, without letting anyone off the hook, without saying that there aren't struggles over resources and you know, power and um, inequality that need to be engaged in, nonetheless, there is the, the ability to care for each other and rebuild community, and that might be part of what gets us through the, the times ahead. So those are the kind of conversations, I guess, that I've been having as I've gone around the country. And I feel very lucky because I've got to be, I don't know, not so much a train station, more like a sort of, uh, you know, one of those things that you sort of go up along, along the train line by pumping it up and down um, to, to sort of move backwards and forwards between places and carry the stories from place to place and make connections between people who I know but who didn't know each other in some of the places that I've visited. I mean, this is a book that is the fruit of many conversations and a fruit should contain seeds and so my greatest hope for it is that it's a book that will end up seeding lots of conversations as well and so far that's so so far so good I guess great good and on that sort of seed note let's let's plant the first one then so there's a there's a moment in the book that you describe a way back in 2010 so it feels like a long time ago when you found yourself asking the question what do you do after you stop pretending? Um, and I'm going to invite you to just share perhaps a passage from the book that responds to that question. And then I want to throw it open to Rupert and Charlotte as well, because I think these are the moments of epiphanies, and perhaps we could all share an epiphany that we've had ab- about that moment of moving beyond the pretense. Mm. Yeah, there's a chapter in the book that's called How to Give Up. Um, because giving up was sort of an accusation that Paul and I heard a lot in the early days of Dark Mountain. He were like, you know, you guys, you've given up, and worse, you're encouraging other people to give up. And I took, I, you know, when, when things like that get thrown at me, I, I carry them around. I need to try and make sense of both what the other person is seeing and saying and how it looks from where I am. And gradually what came home to me was that, as I say at one point in the book, Giving up is always giving up on something, though at the time it may feel like everything, because you may actually need to go through that moment of giving up, of of going, I can no longer say the things that I've been saying in my talks, because I no longer believe them in my heart, and I have to step back for a bit, and often Dark Mountain has been a place where people come to at that moment. But equally, it's not the end of... like. It's never giving up full stop, or at least it certainly doesn't need to be. That's called getting trapped. Like, actually, you pass through something and you come out somewhere else, seeing what you couldn't see from the position you were standing in before you made that, that move that looked like giving up. And so I guess that, that question that you pointed to is kind of is, is one of the moments for me when I was putting that into words and seeing what was happening. So yeah, I'll just read you about a page or so from the book, which is sort of connecting what was happening in that moment of 2010 for me to then what I was seeing in 2018, 2019 with these new climate movements, XR and Fridays for the Future and the rest of it. What do you do after you stop pretending? I'd written those words one night in early 2010 as we were preparing for the first Dark Mountain Festival. Our manifesto had seeded a cultural movement, a network of activity drawing together artists and activists, engineers and gardeners, hackers and smallholders, centred on the books we published and the gatherings we hosted. It all started with that invitation to look down, to step back from stories you no longer believe in and activities that have become a means of distraction a way of keeping busy enough to not have to think about what you know or fear to be the case. What still seems worth doing after you take that step? It was a question we didn't know how to answer, but which brought a new energy to conversations and spread like a rumour over the years that followed. In these new climate movements of 2018, I glimpsed the outline of an activism that started from the place that question takes us that didn't ask you to voice an optimism that you didn't feel. Much of what I saw rang true to my experiences with Dark Mountain and the strange kind of hope we had found in naming our fears and disillusionments, 
Only now it was spreading at large into the cultural mainstream and galvanising people into action. You caught it in the voices of the figures who found themselves in the spotlight. In place of rallying speeches about what we need to do, they offered prophetic imagery of a house on fire and the dark night of the soul. Not everyone was comfortable at the sight of largely white, largely middle-class crowds marching in funeral procession, watched over by the silent chorus of the red rebels in their robes and white-painted faces. These were not the people with the most to lose soonest as the climate crisis arrived. Why were we grieving over future losses when we ought to be fighting to prevent them? Well, I thought, a lot hangs on what is being mourned. The loss of creatures and landscapes for a start. So many gone, and so much more destruction already written into the story. And other losses too, closer to home. At best, this public grief expressed a willingness to be bereft, to lose much that we have taken for granted, rather than fight to sustain our present ways of living, whatever the cost. I heard this from the groups I spoke to in the summer of 2019, But I remember, too, the words of a woman at one of those events. Her work involved helping people unpack long-suppressed experiences of trauma. The first time someone starts to tell their story, she said, it matters that they get to tell it and know that they are heard. The second time, she went on, it matters that I notice when to stop them. Otherwise, the retelling can harden into an identity, a new shell to hide behind. I wondered about all those who had found in these new climate movements the space to speak the fears they had been carrying alone. These stories too can become a shell if we miss the moment to move deeper, to find the story behind the story. Mm. Thank you. Well, I could epiphanise. You can epiphanise. Mm. <laughs> uh, very powerful piece of, uh, of writing. Beautifully read. Thank you, Dougald. Um, yeah, I mean, because my moment is, is, is really very clear. It's related at the start of my new book, Do You Want to Know the Truth? Uh, it's when, uh, in April 2015, I was uh, delivering some uh, leaflets in Norwich for the Green Party, Uh, which, as some of you will know, I've been very heavily involved in over the years and still am in. Uh, And I found myself getting sort of semi-consciously kind of disturbed by the character of the gardens of the houses that I was delivering the leaflets into. I would notice that in one garden it had been paved over, and the next one there was artificial turf. The next one, obviously, a lot lovely flowers, but a lot of weed killer had self-evidently been... Used. The next one, there was a, a dumped fridge and so on. And I was just, I, I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just somehow noticing this. And I got close to the, the door of one of these houses with this leaflet. And these words just powered into my head. And the words were, this civilization is finished. And I stopped dead for a little while and, and sort of reeled almost finished delivering my leaflet round and went home and um, sort of sat there for a long time kind of thinking, oh, Christ, what am I going to do with this? this? This doesn't fit with all the work I've been doing and all the philosophy I've been writing and some of it's been really worthwhile and some of it's had good effects and so on. But there's something different here. So after a week or two, literally, of kind of stumbling around a bit, I thought, well, there's only one thing I really need to know how to do with something like this, which is to start writing about it. I started writing about it and then I started sharing what I'd written with some trusted friends and colleagues and said do not share this with anybody else I'm not sure this is the kind of thing I should actually allow people to read because it might demoralize them and also I don't want my name on it because I might get attacked and people got back to me and said hang on this is the most important thing you've ever written Um, so smoothed it out some more and uh, circulated some more more positive reports. One of those people then said, you've got to publish this, Rupert. I said, no, I'm not going to publish it. And they said, how about you publish it anonymously? So the first iteration was published anonymously. More good 
feedback, started giving it as a, a talk with a lot of trepidation, because that was obviously breaking into the, the public. Then started saying it to my students at UEA, which was another kind of Rubicon. Um, and students came up to me afterwards and said things like, this feels like the first time in my life that anyone's really leveled with me about where we are and where we're going. And uh, yeah, that was, that was my uh, epiphany and it's determined the course of my life ever since. The talk I gave at Cambridge in 2019, uh, 2018 called This Civilization Is Finished, which went viral, coincided in timing beautifully with the onset of Extinction Rebellion, mm -hmm. which I then helped to launch and it all sort of came together. And, and my life ever since has been um, immeasurably uh, richer. Um, if only the same could be said of the actual response on the policy level and of our planet. Mm. Thank you, Rupert. Gosh, I've had so many. <laughs> Where do I start? Um, I've said to Dougal that I wasn't going to start in Mexico. So, um, so I'm going to start in Norwich, actually. I had an amazing epiphany in Norwich. The same year I met you, actually. Mm. Um, I was helping out at the Occupy camp, which was in Hay Hill at the time. And um, I took part in a commemoration of Ket's Rebellion. And we went with flambards up to the castle and, uh, and stood beneath the, the spot where Ket had been hanged so many um, decades, um, not decades, centuries before. Um, and there was a full moon, and we were standing there with our flambards, just, you know, all the Occupy people and transition people, and um, it was an incredible moment because, as you know, that castle was built um, just uh, as the Norman invasion happened, and... Um, you could just feel the history of it, you know. But well, this civilization is finished. It's been going on far too long, actually, <laughs> Rupert. And what do we do? I mean, talk about being upstream. Uh, Dougal mm. talks a lot about, um, you know, there are things that we are debating now, but actually the problems or the troubles actually start much further um, near a source. And I felt I was just hitting the upstream there because we've all been invaded. We've all been under this great big mashing of modernity for hundreds of years for the taking of land, you know, and, and then it's happened all around the world, but it's also happened here. And there, were, there have been many rebellions, you know. The Ketz Rebellion had 10,000 people out there in the commons, you know. That's a lot of people, especially then. Um, and it was mercilessly quashed, as indeed Occupy was mercilessly squashed. As was, as was what was happening in the Arab Spring, as what was happening with the Extinction Rebellion later, and really how do, you, how do you counter that kind of very negative power is possibly the question that I woke up to at that moment. And I was with a gang of people, and we were just like, we were there together, we were in community, in mm. a way. We had the lights off lambards, and we could see the, the timeline as it was going but we were still there together, and we were still rebelling, and we're going to carry on rebelling like that. Um, that was my epiphany. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, I add mine into the mix, which is... I, I was a bit later to the party, I think. So, like, Dougal pioneering, you alongside him, Rupert in 2015. I wasn't until 2018. Um, and those who know me socially say, so I'm often late to the party, but I'm usually the last to leave. Um, <laughs> So, but it, I mean, for me, it was the wake-up call, I think, of the IPCC in 2018, which is what brought into question my sort of 20 years of environmental consultancy. Um, and it was a bit like your realisation, Rupert, of just, I'm just adding to this miserable incrementalism that is not actually changing anything. And that was a huge sort of crisis of identity for me. That was, you know, exactly that sort of trauma narrative that you were talking about. You know, I didn't... I was hiding behind the defensive shell of my own story, which then more or less crumbled in on itself. Um, and I found myself going, what happens next? What, what am I going to do if, when I stop pretending on this? And it happened at a time of incredible personal loss. I lost, I lost my father and I lost my brother and I lost my... Ryanair of the environment movement business <laughs> um, in quick succession, um, you know, two of which I grieved, one of which um, I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. Um, but I think it's that moment, it was almost like a, an initiation. Like you talk about initiations and thresholds. 
um, in the book. And, and for me, it was like, something different has to happen now. I have to go and do something different. Yeah, it's probably worth me saying a little more about some of these things that you've touched on at the beginning about what I am saying in the book, just, just to be clear, really. Because as you say, I did have this moment in sort of September 2021 when I heard these words come out of my mouth, maybe it's time to stop talking about climate change. <laughs> and I started writing initially thinking I was writing a short essay to explain myself. And it, in order to explain myself, if only to myself, I needed to write what became a book. But you know, the, the, thing that, the thing that I was seeing there is that the language of taking climate change seriously can point in such opposing directions now that it can almost get in the way of seeing clearly the choices that lie ahead. Because if you come to a fork in the road and you have the same thing written on the sign pointing in each direction, then it's hard to recognise or make a good decision about that fork in the road. And so that's what I'm trying to set out in the book. I say that there is kind of, there, there is, to simplify it, there is now a big path and a small path. And the big path is a kind of superhighway on which lots of different slip roads are converging from left and right, from Silicon Valley, from fully automated luxury communism, you know, from lots of corners of the spectrum. It also happens to be, in my judgment, a highway to nowhere. You know, it's based on assumptions about what the world is like and how we relate to it that I do not think will play out. I don't think have been proven by the history of modernity. It's a kind of doubling down on the logics of modernity. There's a really powerful quote from two anthropologists, Mario Blazer and Marisol de la Cadena, that I kept coming back to in the writing of the book, where they're talking about the whole conversation about the Anthropocene and how it sounds from elsewhere. Because they say, you know, the sites of enunciation of the Anthropocene discourse and, frankly, the proposals for alternative names for the Anthropocene are Berlin and Stockholm and Norwich and New York. And well, that's good company. <laughs> uh, and... Oh, from elsewhere, it sounds a lot like, in the language of the Zapatistas, the world of the powerful becoming conscious of the possibility that its world too could end, having ended so many other worlds and called that progress, development, salvation, whichever vocabulary was in vogue in a particular century. And then this gives this sense of the fork in the road, because... You know, there are two ways that that new felt sense of precarity can land. On the one hand, it can be a humbling moment. It can be a point where it becomes possible for us to hear and enter into a more real dialogue with things that people have been trying to tell us from elsewhere in the world for generations about the shadow side of modernity, about the destructive impacts of the ways of thinking and the story of progress. Or it can become the source of legitimacy for a last desperate reboot of the logics of modernity and the story of progress. You know, one final go at a top-down uh, centralised project of making the world an object of human uh, management and control from places that happen to be geographically very similar to the places from which that project has been carried out as colonialism in recent centuries... And that matters a lot, like which of those forks we take. So I'm saying that there's the big path and then the small path, which isn't really a single path. It branches in many directions and many ways. And it's, it's what happens when we're not trying to secure the futurity of the trajectories of growth, development, technological progress. But we're trying to work for the possibility of lives worth living in the worlds to come and softening, limiting the damage, softening the impact of the fall as the world as we have known it continues to come to an end so that's really like that's the climate conversation that I'm trying to start with the book and it just felt worth sort of trying to land that stuff into this into the conversation Rupert you look like you might have something to say yeah well I've got one sort of addendum to that which is I think that's very well put and I wanted to highlight what I think is the 
possibly the ultimate form of the the big road, which we are starting to to see uh, being talked about and experimented towards and so forth, uh, and which is a really disturbing kind of yeah mushrooming and and expanding of this big road into something hugely disturbing. And what I'm talking about is climate engineering, or what's been called uh, before that geoengineering, the idea of engineering the whole planet to cope with the situation. So we've, we've created this absolutely unholy mess of which um, dangerous climate change is simply the biggest uh, symptom. Uh, and you might think this would be giving people pause about attempts to uh, control more and more of nature uh, and extract more and more uh, and, and pollute more and more and so forth. But the gambit with climate engineering is to say, no, actually... Um, you can carry on, you can carry on polluting because we're going to control the entire uh, atmosphere and we're going to make it safe to, to carry on. So one of the key forms of this, which is, uh, you know, and I'm not kidding here to anyone who hasn't heard this before, although more and more people by now have heard of it, is basically mirrors in space, uh, tiny mirrors in space, which will reflect some of the sunlight off, allegedly, and cool us down so we can carry on basically doing what we're doing. And it seems to me that the big road doesn't get any bigger of thinking we can control the entire system of which we are a part in order to carry on with the same civilization that we currently uh, have. And you, t- I mean, and that touches on this notion, doesn't it, that you, you explore quite a lot in the book, Dougal, about the climate emergency, you know, and the use of that emergency framing. Because, you know, one of the first things I think you, you describe is the fact that when, you, when a government declares a state of emergency, the first thing you have to do is register with the UN to say when that emergency will come to an end. And, and coming back to Rupert's point, I think if, when you have this open-ended declaration of emergency, it opens the door for yeah. that sort of ratcheting yeah. up of the system, that perverse cycle where mm. the crisis gets worse, the lived experience and the impacts of climate change become more severe... So governments impose measures which usually hit the poor hardest. Those poor people rebel or push back. That then justifies you know, inaction on the part of governments failing to, to do and make the difficult decisions, which can then lead to the worst of the extremes and then the justification of more authoritarian or even sort of eco-fascist um, type of approaches or these kind of space technology geoengineering type of solutions and mm. I think you know you talk a lot in the book about the, the, the faith in science or this belief in science and this, this frame of science and you know as someone who trained as a marine biologist and as a scientist that for me was one of the most sort of profound parts you know because I've orientated a lot of my career around trusting the science and following the science and and I've often found myself saying those exact words, you know, tell the truth and act like it's real and and felt that in all of those XR framings as well, which I think were very potent. But uh, you take us into a very interesting territory around that, 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 that trouble with that scientific and political and financial capital all aligning to create a sort of straitjacket where we might lose whilst claiming we're actually winning? Well, the, just to c- quickly try and capture a sense of what it is I say about science in the book. I no, mean, no, I don't want to misrepresent it, 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 Yeah, it, it's, the, the book is very much written out of friendship towards you know, the climate scientists I've known, some of whom are my friends, um, and equally activists and the other people whose work I touch on in the book. And there's a whole section of the book called Asking Too Much of Science, where I say that to ask science to carry the whole weight of knowing a thing like climate change, let alone also telling us what to do, that's not to be a friend to science. You know, if your friend is on a rooftop tripping on acid and convinced they can fly, to be a friend to them is not to go, yeah, man, go for it. To be a friend is to go put a hand over their shoulder and say, why don't we sit down over here and have a little chat? And in the same way, I'm not saying that as individuals, I, like most of the scientists I have known as individuals I have a very grounded notion of their flying ability. And you know, most of the people who are most rhetorically over the top with 
this category error of treating science as an object of belief tend never to have seen the inside of a lab. But nonetheless, structurally, there is a kind of role that science and the sciences have occupied within modern society that asks them to carry more weight than they can. And so what I say early on in the book is, as you said earlier, climate science, no, climate change asks us questions that climate science cannot answer. Starting with the question, how did we find ourselves here? Is it a piece of bad luck with the atmospheric chemistry? Or is it a consequence of a way of approaching the world, a way of seeing and treating everything and everyone that would always have brought us to such a pass, even if the atmospheric chemistry and the climate system had been different, even if it had been less sensitive to the CO2 emissions? And I think that any response to climate change actually embodies an answer one way or the other to that question. But in order for the question to be framed and talked about clearly, we have to enlarge the space within which the conversation needs to happen beyond the frame of the part of the story that climate science and the natural sciences are able to tell us. And I think that that's something that actually, for me, has come out of dialogue with scientists about the discomfort of the way in which it's not simply that what we need is better message delivery from the science to everybody else. It's that there's something not quite right about the role that the natural sciences have been asked to play within the process of knowing and responding to the trouble the world is in, not least the part of that trouble that rides under the name of climate change. Charlotte? I'm going to respond to that. Great. There's a really interesting part in your book, there, Dougal, is something I've been working with for a very, very long time, which is that actually when you look at science and, the, and, and in the way that we were when, we, when I was in transition, always looking at, in terms of carbon capture, not ca carbon numbers, these flip charts I mentioned earlier, it's all the rational, logical, sort of uh, facts and figures way of looking at the planet. And that is not just the planet, the whole of life ourselves, what's going on in our bodies, how we relate to people. It's all measured in a particular way, and I know that you, you write a lot about this in the book, and the fact is we don't see the planet. We're not seeing it, because we don't see that with a rational mind that's extremely narrow, and it's being made more and more narrow um, by the political system that we're under, the pressures that we're under. As a result, we don't really know the mess we're in because we can't actually see it. Not only that, but then we're not backed by the very being that we're supposed to be saving. We have no relationship with the planet itself, all the, all the myriad creatures that are part of it, all the actual uh, the sea and the, all the actual air. We have no relationship. We don't have that language. So when I met you in, on Civilization, that was a sense that not only was that language, that lexicon, being engaged in on a mythic level, on an ancestral level, with the planet itself, but also there was space and time in our conversations that other things could come into play. Because I feel that whatever we talk about, whether we're scientists or artists, there's just not the room in the conversation. Um, there's not the time, because everything's going like this all the time. Solution, 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 techno fix, techno fix. Um, emergency, you know, we're not gonna even be able to say hello to each other. <laughs> And that's okay. the difference between a problem and a predicament, isn't it? it? Is, Which, yes. again, is something that you expand on in the book. But, you know, there is obviously, if you treat the world as a problem to be solved, you're going to go at everything with the hammer and the proverbial nail, rather than trying to reconcile the complexities and the tensions and the, and the difficulties of the underlying relationships which is actually what the predicament is, which doesn't have any easy resolution. And I was, I was really struck by uh, the example you used, Dougald, in the book from, from Norway, um, from um, Kari Norgard, mm. uh, and the work in, in, in the small village that was experiencing some of the impacts of climate change, and her conclusion that people didn't, they didn't, they didn't know, or well, not knowing how to know. They couldn't get their heads around the enormity. The not wanting to know was connected to the yeah. not knowing yeah. how to know, is yeah. what she says, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, it was, and it, that's the bit that, that stuck with me. It's like, how do you, in that predicament, how do you embrace the vulnerability and the sense of loss and grief that we've all touched on in some way, um, shape or form here, without just slipping into fear and denial and hopelessness. Mm. Because I think that's the, the real axis 
that you pro- that you provide and the, uh, the, the work in this book provides that helps us trying to navigate the trap yeah mm. that there can still be hope and important and powerful things to do without the paralysis that embracing the reality usually tends to kind mm. of be, be the, the, the the outcome of I think we should throw this open in a moment to, to bring in some voices from the floor. Just one last bit on the problem and predicament thing, which I, I picked up from John Michael Greer, where he says, a problem is something that can be fixed and made to go away, and you're essentially back in a situation that resembles the situation beforehand. A predicament is, not, is something where there are, still, there are actions worth taking, but none of those actions will create a, you know, a return to the pre-existing conditions. And the thing that I didn't see when I was writing about this in the book that was brought home to me by John O'Shea, who's a fascinating artist and curator who's done a lot of work with scientists, we were talking about this ahead of the event we did together in Sheffield. And out of that conversation, we arrived at this recognition that a problem framing invites technocratic responses. It invites a response where you go, right, we need to get the right group of experts in the room and come up with the right answer and then convince everybody and make the politicians, get the politicians on board and do it. A predicament framing opens the possibility that the, better, that, that the best way of finding an answer is something democratic. Because if there isn't a single right solution in the way that there is with a problem, if what it is is a difficult situation that we're going to have to find ways of living with and ways of going forward through, then that invites involving everybody, involving far more voices and perspectives and experience in finding pathways to navigate the landscape which that predicament has thrown us into. And that was something I hadn't noticed when I was writing the book, but I think might be one of the helpful things that we can open up from the, from the problem and predicament framing. Can I just take that up in relation to the point a few minutes ago about emergency? It seems to me that the problem, if that's the right word, mm-hmm. with the emergency framing is that it makes it seem, it makes what's going on seem closer to a problem than to a predicament. So an emergency, it's, it's bad, right? It's urgent. But it's something that could be brought to an end, that could be fixed. Or in the last resort, something you can run away from. Mm-hmm. None of those things are true. Like even the bolt hole of New Zealand has been exposed mm-hmm. by the horrifying recent events is actually not going to be somewhere which is going to laugh, enable people to actually run away from this. And so the emergency frame sets us up for authoritarianism or high-tech fantasies or at best for a kind of burnout where we're trying to solve something which is not of the nature to be solved. So this is why I started to use the phrase, it's a more than emergency, Hmm. more dash than dash emergency. And it's a more than emergency because it's actually worse than an emergency, right? Calling it an emergency simultaneously gets the nature of the problem wrong and understates the the character of it and the severity of it. Ultimately, what what we're dealing with here, and I think it's been implicit in what we've all been saying, is a civilizational, a philosophical, a spiritual challenge. That's much more serious than an emergency. That cuts to the absolute root of it. You have to go, as you put it, Googled, seriously upstream in order to get to, get to the roots of that. Mm. So we've got a microphone here. We haven't been sufficiently organised as to have somebody... Yeah. Oh, we have. We've got, we've got someone. I'm sorry. Wonderful. <laughs> Oh, great. So, who has something you'd like to bring into this conversation, whether it's in the form of a question or something else? Just put, put your hand up and... Ah, oh, there we go. Bridget is being quick with the hand up there in the middle. Thank you for that. Um, some of you will know that I co-founded Culture Declares Emergency, so I thought I should maybe speak first to carry on with this emergency thing. Um, so... We feel that it's acceptable to declare emergency despite your, your issues with it because we are people and sectors doing it. Um, and we're also um, forming community after making declarations, communities of inquiry that use the power of culture to question, you know, what is this thing? Is it an emergency? Um, so I think that um, what's really important is to it, it, use the... the to use whatever terms work with whatever audiences and with whatever, in whatever situations, as long as your approach is expanded enough 
is enabling imagination and also um, expands beyond just talking about climate to talk, talking about the wider earth crisis. So, um, oh, it's not really a question, is it? But, you know, the power of culture, I suppose. You know, you might want to comment on the power of culture. Thanks, Bridget. I'm glad that you've kind of spoken up for the different ways in which the language of emergency can be operating. You know, Duncan, who sat in the front row, and I actually wrote together um, a piece about emergency democracy that was inspired precisely by our kind of ambivalence about the language of emergency, but a sort of recognition that there was something very alive in the way that it was being invoked in these new movements in 2018, 2019, and a recognition just from the sort of history of political thought that the default meaning of emergency in a political context is less democracy. It's the suspension of rights and the rule of law. And that you know, something very interesting and new and different was going on with these kind of movements in different sectors, movements at grassroots in different places in the world of activists asking for a declaration of emergency. And we wanted to foreground the strangeness of this so as to invite other possibilities to emerge from the language of emergency. And we said, you know, if you invoke the language of emergency politically... And if the default implication of that is less democracy, then we need to foreground in precisely the way actually the XR was doing with its third demand, the call for more democracy as part of how we respond to it. So I think you know, there's, there's lots that's fertile in the ways that the language of emergency has been being used. Yeah, and the idea of upgrading democracy. Mm. Quite helpful here, yeah. Mm. The hand near the front there. Thank you. Um, a question actually not for, Goog for Dougal, but for the other three. You three have all read the book, and you're all of a reasonably switched on level. Two aspects about the book. What surprised you that Dougal included? And also, what disappointed you? What old thing did he bring up that he didn't actually solve? And you're just thinking he's beating the bandwagon. So... What really got to you and you thought, actually, Dougal's inspiring me to better thinking, and which one were you actually a bit disappointed with? <laughs> Who wow. wants to go first? <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> I'm willing to have a go. I'm, I've, I've, I've been disappointed in Dougal for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, do, I do have answers, and it's great that someone's asked this question, right? We don't yeah. want it all just to be mutual self-congratulation and... Uh, and praise of your fascinating book, which is fascinating. Um, it really is. Um, I loved it. I love it. And, it and, and when I sent you an email, didn't I? I said, mm. the best chapter of all is the final one. And that's a great thing to say about a book mm. when it actually ends really, really well. So, uh, a surprise. I was surprised that the book um, stressed so much the role of science in relation to climate and the crisis. Uh, and my big question for Dougal is why not say more about precaution, about the precautionary principle, which is a kind of philosophical jurisprudential principle that basically says, actually, when the stakes are sufficiently high, we can and should go uh, beyond what science has proved in order to, to act to keep ourselves safe. So a classic example is um, we acted to try to protect the ozone layer before we knew all the details of the science and just how bad it was. A more recent example is the EU acted to ban neonicotinoid pesticides before they were categorically proven to be deadly to bee colonies, which they've now been categorically proven to be. Uh, so my surprise was, why not emphasise the role of precaution more? Because when you do that, then some of the heat around the discussions around science starts to diminish a little. And um, my disappointment... God, this is tough. This is really... He's really forcing us... To, this is really harsh. Uh, my disappointment was in relation to some of what uh, Dougal says in the book around uh, COVID. In particular, um, Dougal has this very interesting stance on uh, COVID whereby he suggests, look, um, we should be um, somewhat impressed, at least, by what Sweden um, accomplished. Uh, we should be... Um, uh, we should be honest about the fact 
that uh, some of the COVID responses were not uh, as effective as they've been claimed to be, and so on and so forth. And he makes a bunch of good points. But my disappointment was that he didn't come clean on the implication of his claims around COVID. The implication is, if we had uh, taken the kind of line that was taken in Sweden all over the world, um, many, many more people would have died. Uh, and I know people who died of COVID, and I know people who've been in emer emergency rooms and intensive care from COVID, and I know people who've got long COVID, and it's destroying their lives in at least uh, one of those cases. And the plain fact is, and I didn't feel you quite came clean on this, that if we'd have followed your recommendations, uh, tens of millions more people would have died, tens of millions of more people would have had uh, long COVID. And I think you should have stated that clearly and honestly in the book. So I think I'd better respond to that. Just, um, You're not allowed to. I, well, <laughs> who makes the rules around it? He does, because he's <laughs> No, just, just to be absolutely clear that actually I don't. I, I, I say in the introduction to the book, whole books will be written about the way in which Sweden responded to COVID. I'm really not clear that... Um, the way that Sweden responded would have worked elsewhere. I definitely do not assert that. I make no policy prescriptions in relation to COVID. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to Rupert and I recording a one-to-one -one conversation where we dig into this, which we've already talked about doing, because I think it's really... Like, if I could choose someone to explore this with more thoroughly, I think you're the, exactly the right person, Rupert, so I'm glad you've brought it up tonight. But just to be clear... Like, it's not that I am kind of saying that everywhere I should have followed the Swedish approach. I don't say that in the book. Uh, what I do is I write from the experience of having lived through the pandemic as an Englishman who's very settled in Sweden um, and experiencing how it was playing out in the two countries that I have called home without pretending that there are any easy answers to it. So I look forward to that, that further conversation, but I thought I should just clarify that point so that no one goes away with the idea that the book says that the UK ought to have done, ought to, ought to have followed the policy that Sweden followed, because that's, I don't say that. Mm. No, Anybody else? Shall I wade in with my <laughs> Yeah, you have to do it. <laughs> God, it's like one of those awful games you play when you've had too much to drink. Um, <laughs> too little to drink. Or too little, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not disappointed in your book, Dougal, but um, I felt there were things that, coming from our original conversation, mm. it was so, it's so interesting, this book, because it, it really does, you know, you go to a lot of places, there are a lot of intersections, and there are lots and lots of ideas and people and conversations within it, but what I longed for at some point was to kind of go deep, mm. <laughs> yeah, go really, really deep into mm. some of the real intrinsic, maybe more mythic, maybe more um, stuff to do with energy, um, because in a sense, a lot of our problems have been caused by a very heinous relationship with fossil fuels. And I feel, felt that was slightly missing in the book. Mm. Um, and that's, that could be me, because that's my interest, um, because it drives so much, not just because it absolutely powers everything we do, including these microphones, every, everything that we're making, that we're, mm. we're, we're wearing, we're eating, is totally oil. Um, but I think that the, that the stuff of the oil itself also, in a way, by Akon Malafe would say, that the oil itself is part of an assemblage that we're, that we're of. It's a non-human actor within the way we're behaving. Mm. And unless we mm. look at that really deep, dark, difficult, non-human stuff, mm. um, we're not really going to come to that kind of conversation that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, to I, totally, I totally take that, Charlotte. Next book. <laughs> next book. <laughs> yeah. Or your next book. <laughs> Oh, are we allowed a pleasant surprise? Oh, yeah. cheat. Yeah, I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> then I'm going to do my disappointment. Um, so the pleasant surprise, there's, there is that absolutely magical moment in the, in the final chapter when you're talking about the, the Sami people, and I'm going to mangle the pronunciation, mm. but Govosabas? No, I, I'm not going to try and improve You're not going to try and say I'm not going to try and improve on it. <laughs> no. so us. Mm. Yeah, but which is basically... The light that can be heard. Yeah, the, light, the way that the Sami people describe the aurora borealis as the light that can be heard. And that, to me, was of such a poetic way of describing this tension between 
the science and the knowing. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and you elucidated it a bit further around uh, Newfoundland fisher folk um, mm. who also could tell that the new mechanised, industrialised fishing was going to destroy those fish stocks. And that really, really chimed with me because, I mean, I used to be a fishery scientist. It's how I got into broader environmental campaigning in the first place. Um, so I, I loved that. That was a real, mm. really like a, a magical surprise. And I guess my disappointment <laughs> is a little is is a little connected to that because having worked with you and having had so many incredible conversations with you and read so much of your other writing, you you actually said, and it plays a bit to Charlotte's point. You ask in the book, where is the essence, the poetry, the midnight language of loss and longing? Mm the subtle language of twilight and the raw language of the wolf hour before dawn. And in some senses, I know you can write and talk like really viscerally through that. Um, and this book, in some ways, and I'm, I'm sure there's a purpose and a, and a rationale behind this, feels like a very cool, calm and collected Google. <laughs> um, where we could have perhaps done with a bit more sharp teeth and fur and claws and, and howling at the moon. <laughs> but, maybe oh. that's, but maybe that's not the function of this book. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, all of you. That's, um, thank you for that's an extremely sharp question. <laughs> Everyone sharp. remember that question and yeah. ask it next time you go to a book launch. <laughs> I'm one of us, so, yeah. <laughs> And what were you surprised and disappointed by in your own book? Oh, <laughs> so many things. We haven't got time. <laughs> There's a lot of surprises in the process of writing a book, actually. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, next episode of the podcast, we can yeah. do that. <laughs> who else, who else is, is sitting there with uh, Duncan on the front row? Thank you. Um, I haven't read the book yet, so... I'm looking forward to it. But in what you've all talked about, there were quite a lot of references to the, to us, really, now in the rich West, looking down the barrel of the end of our civilization. And I was really delighted, oh, delighted is the wrong word, but pleased to hear you in every reference then to, to point out that many other communities have already face the end of their civilizations, their ways of life. Um, my question, though, is really if any of you can, can offer thoughts on what can be done to prevent disintegration into even more inequality as Western civilization, for want of a better word, implodes. Anyone want to go first on that? Oh, just, Simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're go, yeah, okay. Something I really, really like about Dougal's book is he talk, he's talking about when everyone comes together, you're coming to face what were you saying too about the predicament. You're coming together to come to a, a conclusion within a group because it needs to be diverse. You know, we are in a monoculture. If you think of a wheat field, we're in a monoculture. But how to survive and become resilient is to listen to many, many different voices. So I'm, going, I'm answering in a very kind of roundabout way. We really need a culture where, we, where we're not stuck individualism. We need to break out of that individualism and not stop geoengineering our reality. Um, because in that way, we will never, ever come to understanding what other people are coming to. So... It could start with empathy, but we've got to come... You know, all this is coming from... Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're talking from our heads, right? But how we get here into our hearts, into our bodies, mm -hmm. with our feet on the ground, this ancestral being, Earth, we will not know how to relate to our fellow human beings, um, quite apart from all the other creatures. And so, therefore, I think creating a culture that allows us to come to conclusions within a group, mm -hmm. such as you're saying. So these very different kinds of spaces. We need social practice... <laughs> You know, that's an art and a skill that we're not used to. We're not used to busting out of our individualism. We want to control everything, mm. which you talk about a lot, right? Mm. Controlling reality. We can't. We've got to let it happen to us and swim and dance mm. with it. And with each other. We've got to care, as you were talking about, mm. that, you know, what's happening in Britain in the massive inequality, we've got to care. And we can only do that with hearts open and flourishing and being intelligent. 
because the real government is here. It's not mm. here. Mm. For the podcast listeners, Charlotte was thumping her heart when she <laughs> said that the real government is here. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I agree with what Charlotte said to, in response to this incredibly difficult question. I just want to add something mm. sort of on a different dimension, which is that the real inequality is not even the obscene inequality which is rampant across our world and you're asking rightly, could it get even worse? The real inequality is the intergenerational inequality. The real inequality is that at present, the very strong likelihood is that the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of virtually all of us, including of most of the rich and even the super-rich, are going to be immeasurably worse off than we are. So I love us to, whenever we talk about inequality, not just think about it across space, but across time. Thanks, Rupert. That's a really helpful piece of this. Um, something else that came to mind for me, it's not a direct answer to the question, but it is a, a strand within the book, is noticing how often we are invited to be the heroes or the villains, those of us who are you know, the, in the privileged um, 10% at least, and probably rather higher up than that globally, who are sat in rooms like this. We're invited to be the heroes and save everything. We're invited to be the villains, the ones whose fault it all is. It's not that there's no truth in any of those things, but both of those can obscure our cluelessness, our helplessness. And one of the things that kind of came out as I was writing the book, partly from Amitav Ghosh, who um, you know, provided some really helpful reflections as I was finishing the book, was... Uh, the thing that he wants to emphasise is how those who are often marked as more helpless are actually more resilient, and those who are marked as having you know, a- access to huge amounts of resources as you know, the powerful within the world are deeply lacking in resilience and you know, precarious in a different way to um, billions of people in the world, and it's like it would be way easy to oversimplify that in the opposite direction. But just to name that the usual maps, even when they're done with good intentions, are also a kind of oversimplification. And where that goes as well by the end of the book is just this emphasis on the assumptions we make about where the agency lies. Because I begin to notice in these encounters that are part of what led me to write the book with people deep inside national and intergovernmental. Uh, institutions who have reached a point of being really panicked about climate change and that you know they it's like they lose faith in the promises their institutions make they no longer really believe that you know that we can save the world and um, fix climate change and build a sustainable future in the way that the institutions they're working within feel that they have to say but they haven't questioned the theology of their lost faith. They still think of the world as a thing that is in need of saving by people like them sitting in offices like the ones that they sit in. And that leads them either to a kind of flat pessimism that is quite different to anything that Paul and I ever encountered around Dark Mountain. Or worse, to cycling between that pessimism and a desperate optimism, which is precisely what sends them into the geoengineering space and the rest of it, and like breaking that doom loop between flat pessimism and desperate optimism that those people are in and saying like if something is going to make all the difference the agency of that is probably going to turn out in hind well that was frustrating about two minutes before the end of our conversation as i was in full flow the audio on the recording cut out the point that i was making was that if in hindsight it turns out that something did make all the difference that may well end up coming from somewhere that wasn't assumed to be where the agency lies in the conversations that normally happen in the rooms where we gather around the trouble that the world is in including the part of that trouble that rides under the name of climate change and that was pretty much how our conversation ended in front of a very engaged and interesting audience that night in Norwich. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) 
Thank you for listening to this special episode of The Great Humbling. Thanks to Charlotte and Rupert and to the folks at Norwich Arts Centre for making the live event happen. Ed and I are really grateful for all of the responses we get from listeners. You can find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling. You can find Ed on the platform formerly known as Twitter as at Frucal. We'll be back in a few weeks' time with the first episode of our fifth season. Meanwhile, if you'd like to get more deeply involved with the conversation, go to homewardbound.org and sign up for my substack, Writing Home.